Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Today, I am delighted to host a gathering of scalds, featuring our good friend and exceptionally talented author, Genevieve Gornacek. I think it would be fair to say, Genevieve has had a busy year so far. Recently, she was invited to take part in the Modern Mythology panel for Penguin's Random House. If any of you didn't have a chance to tune in, worry not, as I've included the link in today's show description. It was absolutely smashing. 2021 we'll see the publication of Genevieve's debut novel, The Witch's Heart, drawing from her time studying and having a love for the Norse myths and Icelandic sagas, The Witch's Heart has many of us in the Twitter community eagerly awaiting the arrival of our copy. And all being well, we will have a chance to welcome Genevieve back for what will be a fantastic discussion of all things myth, legend and lore. I'm happy to say we have a video accompanying today's reading You will find it over on the YouTube channel for the podcast, and all links mentioned here today can be found in the show description. Without further ado, please welcome Genevieve to a gathering of Skalds. Hi, my name's Genevieve Gornacek, and I'm an author of historical fantasy inspired by the Norse myths and Icelandic sagas. My debut novel, The Witch's Heart, releases February 9th, 2021 from Ace Books, and it's a reimagining of Norse mythology from start to finish from the point of view of Loki's wife, Angerboda. And while I'm so excited to be able to share that story next year, what I have for you today are some readings from my short story entitled What the Gods Left Behind, which was first published in Luna Station Quarterly Magazine in March of 2020. Even though it's a dystopian story set in the not-so-far future, it still includes some of those Norse elements we love so much. And the selections I've chosen for you today are the ones that really bring that out in the story. So, without further ado, let's find out what the gods left behind. When our story begins, we find our heroine Katla on a cross-country journey across the United States on foot from Texas into Canada, and she comes upon a farmhouse where she hopes to scavenge for some food. She's wary of staying in houses because, one, there's plague-infected dead bodies abounding, and two, she started seeing ghosts, and she doesn't quite believe it herself. The ghosts tend to hang around their bodies. When she finds the farmhouse empty of food, she ends up running into a child ghost who appears and tells her to check the treehouse where he stashed some food while he was still alive. As the child led them across the yard, Katla stopped short when she saw a dog leering at her from the tall grass between her and the tree. She'd grown wary of wild dogs on her journey. Many had turned vicious with starvation, but this one she recognized. This dog had been following her since Kansas City, despite her best attempts to lose it. And it talked, which to Katla was more worrying than her suddenly being able to see ghosts. You, she hissed, get lost, mutt. The dog looked smug. Gravel dust from the road coated its scraggly gray fur and pointed ears. One eye was a piercing blue, the other clouded and milky as if it belonged not to the creature but to some more ancient thing. You can't get rid of me that easily, Katla Brynjolfsdotter, it said. Katla started, for she'd never told the dog her name. Any of them. She'd grown so used to being called Cat Dawes here in America that hearing her given name gave her pause. It's official, she thought. I'm going mad. He looks like a good boy, said the ghost child. Or girl, I can't tell. Boy, Katla said, for the timbre of the dog's voice in her head was distinctly male. The problem was, of course, that it had a voice in the first place. Leave me alone, Katla snapped, stomping forward menacingly in an attempt to scare it off. But the dog didn't move, so she stared it down as she headed past it toward the tree, placing a tentative boot on the bottom rung of the wooden ladder against the trunk. It seemed a solid foothold, so she made her way up carefully, step by step, testing her weight, and that of the camping pack strapped to her back, to make sure the decomposing wood wouldn't crumble beneath her feet. 
The ghost child had followed her through the grass and now observed her ascent, looking wounded. I'm just trying to help. I wasn't talking to you, kid, Katla grunted as she climbed. A few of the rungs buckled beneath her weight, so she moved faster. Only a few feet to go. Who are you talking to, then? The ghost child called up to her with a sideways glance at the dog, who, of course, now wore the blank stare of a normal, witless animal. Katla heaved herself up onto the platform and crawled into the treehouse. Once she pulled herself to a sitting position, she unclasped the pack's straps from the front of her chest before flinging it off her shoulders and sagging with relief. Fumbling for her flashlight in the gloom, she craned her head over the edge of the platform and saw the dog plop itself down at the base of the ladder. It stared up at her with patient disinterest, like it had all the time in the world and nothing better to do. "'You're a creep,' Katla muttered, then yelped when she turned and saw that the ghost child had suddenly appeared in the corner. His body gave off a soft, ethereal glow, which brightened with worry as Katla nearly dropped her flashlight. "'Sorry, I, I didn't mean to frighten you,' he cried, holding up his hands. "'It's all right,' Katla said, regaining her composure. Before she shone the flashlight anywhere else, she said cautiously, "'Your body isn't up here, is it?' The remains of plague victims were still contagious long after the affliction had taken their lives, and if the plague had taken him... "'No,' he gave a nod toward the house. "'It's in my bedroom.' Katla studied him. "'Your parents just left it there.' The child lowered his hands and looked away. They left me here. When I got sick, they went for help, and they never came back. Not even after I was gone. I see. Her skin prickled with goosebumps. The plague, then. It must have been in the early days, back when we thought there was a cure. Either that or his parents had already known there was no hope and had no choice but to leave the child to die rather than risk catching the sickness themselves. Before the lights went out, they were saying on my daddy's radio show that the world was coming to an end, the child said, as if reading her thoughts. Daddy has been collecting cans and water jugs since before I was born, he deflated. The looters took everything from the cellar. Katla felt a twinge more sympathy for the child's parents. If they'd left all their supplies behind, they probably meant to return. Any number of things could have prevented them from doing so. But... The child added, mistaking her expression for disappointment about the food situation. I hid some of it up here before I got real sick. He scooted to the opposite corner, where a blue plastic tarp covered a lumpy pile the size of a small child. Katla was glad that they'd already established that his body wasn't in the treehouse. She went to lift the tarp, careful not to touch the ghost child's form, for, as she'd learned the hard way, she very much could. And she gasped. This is incredible, she whispered. Tears prickled her eyes as she took it all in, her flashlight trembling in her hands. Along with water filters and several cans of soup she hadn't tasted since before the collapse, there were also at least a dozen boxes of protein bars stuffed into clear plastic bins to keep them safe from rodents and raccoons. She waited another long moment before asking, How can I ever repay you? So what follows is that the kid asked Katla to bury his body so he could pass on and be with his family, which is risky business considering that his remains could carry the plague. But she says she'll do it tomorrow, and that night they get to talking and she reveals that she's on a journey from Texas to her mother's cabin in Gimli on Lake Winnipeg in Canada. During the night, she thinks back to how her daughter Bryn died from the plague and how she accidentally exercised Bryn's ghost when she appeared to Katla to say that her mother had told her to come to Gimli and to find her. In the morning, the boy notices the corner of a book poking out of her backpack, and the conversation goes as follows. What's it called? he asked, staring blankly at the words on the cover. This, it's a book from my homeland across the ocean, a book of Norse myths. Myths, the boy echoed, confused. Yep, they're like very old stories about the gods and goddesses that people used to believe in. People like my parents. Her father, the climatologist who'd lit candles and made offerings to Odin and Thor and Frey. Her mother, the biochemist who'd left out offerings for the land spirits. Would you like me to read them to you? The boy nodded. Katla had to wonder if he had any concept at all of what she was talking about, but he asked no more questions, so she cracked open the dusty spine and began. The book contained simple retellings of the myths, the crude and gruesome bits, 
all the good parts, all the important parts, cleaned up and packaged nicely for children. She gestured at the illustrations as she read the stories of the Nine Worlds, of the gods, one Ido, then in his magic spear and his many names, beautiful Freya and her golden necklace and her falcon cloak, and cunning Loki, mighty Thor, and all the rest. She read all the way up to Ragnarok, their end. The sun had almost risen by then. Ragnarok? The boy repeated after her, frowning. It almost sounds like what happened to us, doesn't it? To our world. Katha said nothing. She'd read the book so many times that she could see the illustration in her mind before she turned the page. It showed the young gods, the ones who'd survived Ragnarok, pulling their ancestors' possessions from the ashes as the world renewed around them, green and thriving where the gods' halls and Ausgarden stood. Through the window, Katla caught a glimpse of something shooting across the brightening sky, the tiny speck of space station Earth containing some of the world's brightest scientists, but also those who had the money to buy salvation, the ones whose wealth and power had caused all of this in the first place, saved, the rest of humanity, the victims of their greed, left behind to die. The last thing Katla heard before the lights went out was that the scientists aboard the station were eventually planning to terraform and colonize Mars, a rumor that had been going around for years before the collapse. Except now, instead of being the hope of all mankind, Mars would be a planet inhabited only by the rich and the super-intelligent. I wonder if they'll come back one day and dig up what's left of us, she thought darkly. I wonder if we'll be artifacts in a Martian museum. Gosh! The ghost child ran his hand over the illustration of Thor's red-headed twins, unearthing his famous hammer, Mjolnir. His fingers were dangerously close to brushing her hand. So Katla twitches away from the boy when he's about to touch her, because she knows that if he touches her even by accident, he will be accidentally exorcised, which she found out the hard way when she did the same thing to her daughter's ghost. So she says, I've got to go. She buries his body. The talking one-eyed dog comes back to harass her, along with a talking sparrow who tells him to stop harassing her. She walks with the boy to the edge of his property, and he's kind of sulking because he's disappointed at not having passed on, so she finally exorcises him too and then just kind of stands there, staring at the empty air. I hope you get where you're going, kid, she whispered. Katla Brynjolf's daughter, deliverer of lost souls, said a derisive voice from behind her. Did you ever dream that this would be your life back when you were doing taxes for a living? What if this is real? Katla said under her breath staring at her palm where she'd touched the boy. She didn't have to see the one-eyed dog to know that it was watching her from the overgrown cornfield. The world ended and I have magic powers. It's preposterous. That's not what your witch of a mother would have said. My mother was a woman of science. She was no witch. You speak of her as if she were dead, as if she hadn't sent your daughter to summon you to her. Oh, what do you know? Katla snapped. The bigger question on her mind was how he knew it, but she wouldn't give him the satisfaction of asking. Oh, please. The dog rolled its one good eye. Humans have been trying to reconcile science and faith since before you were even a thought. You think your parents were any different? He does have a point, child. The sparrow landed on a post in front of her. Civilization as you know it has ceased to exist. Is it so hard to believe that a little magic is creeping its way back into the world? You're wrong. My parents did what they could to help, and I can guarantee you it didn't involve magic. She spat the word as if it were as foul as the plague itself. How can you be sure about that? asked the dog. They have all followed the old gods. Katla cast a menacing glance at the sky and thought of space station Earth, thought of that drawing in her picture book, the remains of Ausgard. Then the old gods were useless, too, she said, and set off down the gravel road toward Gimli. So, of course, as Katla keeps walking, she comes down with the plague, um, but she soldiers on, coming ever closer to the moon, and she's very close to death when she pauses, just yards away from her mother's cabin, wondering if she's imagining all the voices she's hearing from that direction. She tells herself she's only going to rest for a moment, and she closes her eyes. The next time she opened her eyes, she couldn't move her body, and her mother was kneeling above her, gray hair a halo around her head, the outline of her body silver in the moonlight. Is she a ghost? 
Katma was in the clearing now. There were more faces beyond her mother's within her line of vision, and a cabin just beyond them, the clearing full of tents. Am I dead? Katla felt someone take her hand and knew it was her mother. She wanted to scream at them not to touch her because she had the plague, or not to touch her and they would disappear. Her mother's skin was cold, just like the ghost child's had been, and she couldn't exercise her own mother, not after losing Vryn, but she couldn't speak. My brave daughter, said that warm voice from her childhood, just before the people around her flickered and glowed and everything faded to black. It's finally time to rest. The one-eyed dog and the sparrow looked on from beyond the clearing. If anyone had noticed them at that exact moment and seen them from just the right angle, they might not have seen two creatures, but a man in a broad-brimmed hat and tattered traveling cloak, using a spear as a walking stick, and a woman in a rich red mantle with a feathered cape draped over one arm and a golden necklace gleaming at her collar. "'Doesn't count if she dies,' the man grunted to his companion. She won't, the woman said serenely. Her mother has the cure. A beat passed as the man stared at her. You knew this when you chose her, didn't you? That her parents followed the old path that her mother came up with. Fair's fair. The woman's expression betrayed nothing. She made it here and I chose her. That's a point for me and now I'm in the lead. Hmm. He shifted, grumping. The girl has magic in her. You're a cheater. It takes one to know one. He had nothing to say to that besides, Well, on to choose the next foundling. We have many more lost souls to guide. Let's make haste. And he turned to leave. Of course, replied the woman with a cat-like grin as she followed him into the darkness. This new world won't build itself after all. Thanks so much for listening, and if you enjoyed what you heard today, you could check out the full story at lunastationquarterly.com in issue 41. And if you enjoy reading books about mythological giantesses, be sure to check out The Witch's Heart coming February 9th, 2021 from Ace Books. You can find me on Twitter as Ironwitchy or on my website at genevievegornachek.com. It was a pleasure to be on the show today. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much to Siobhan for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Genevieve. It truly has been a joy to have you on the podcast today. Links to Genevieve's website and the Luna Station quarterly issue number 41 are in the podcast description. And The Witch's Heart is due for release on February 9th, 2021. The video accompanying today's reading can be found on the Myth, Legend and Lore YouTube channel. Before we go, I would just like to say thank you to everyone who has backed the Old Norse for Modern Times Kickstarter campaign. It has been a phenomenal success, and a series of stretch goals have also been met, which is just amazing. I know Ian and Joshua are thrilled, and if you follow them on social media, you'll be able to keep up with new developments in the project. The chaps have very kindly asked me to narrate the audiobook, which is a massive compliment. From here on, you might all hear an Old Norse phrase saying, using or verse thrown into every show. But please, do check out the project. I believe we're now in our final hours, but you can find it at www.kickstarter.com forward slash projects forward slash vikingverse forward slash old norse for modern times. The Veed Pearl series with Dr. Johanna Katrine Friedrich's daughter and myself will be back with a bang in a couple of weeks. Our pioneering women of the Vinland sagas are about to engage in some rather memorable scenes, and I can say we have certainly kept the best discussions for last. But I won't be giving away anything else today. I hope you are all well. Do take care for now. From myself and Genevieve, thank you for joining a gathering of skulls. I'm Siobhan Clark, and you've been listening to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast.